Hi, and welcome to That's Roddy Mysterious, a podcast of short tales about true mysteries. What happened to the Flannan Isles Lightkeepers? Who was responsible for the Gardner Museum heist? I'm not going to solve those mysteries, but they'll be interesting to learn about. I'm your host, Kelly with an I. Transcripts for all episodes can be found at thatsruddymysterious.wordpress.com. No apostrophe and no exclamation point. Today's tale is about the Antwerp Diamond Heist. On the weekend of February 15th to 16th, 2003, while the Proximus Games were occurring in Antwerp, thieves carried out what would be dubbed the heist of the century. It was carried out in the Diamond District of Antwerp, Belgium, and was the largest diamond heist of all time and has since been classified as one of the largest robberies in history. The Antwerp Diamond Center Vault was two floors below the main level and was heavily protected by 10 layers of security. The door has a combination lock with 100 possible combinations. Once past that, there is a keyed lock followed by a locked steel grate. The vault door had a magnetic sensor that would detect when the door had been opened. There was a built-in seismic sensor, which would detect any sort of drilling. There were also external security cameras. Vault itself had a keypad for disarming all of the sensors. There was a light sensor inside the vault to detect when the door had been opened. It also had security cameras inside, and there were heat and motion sensors inside to detect when anyone entered. The building the vault was in had a private security force, and the building itself was located in the very heavily guarded Antwerp Diamond District. The Antwerp Diamond District is a several square block area within Antwerp, Belgium. It covers about one square mile. Most of the world's diamonds pass through the district, both legally and on the black market. Over $16 billion worth of diamonds move through the district every year. In the year 2000, Leonardo Notarbartolo rented a sparsely furnished office space in the Antwerp Diamond District for about 25,000 Belgian francs, or about $700 a month. The space offered 24-hour access to the center. His plan was in motion. To increase his credibility, Leonardo began posing as an Italian diamond importer. He began buying small amounts of gems. He made regular trips into the Antwerp Diamond Center, posing as this merchant and carrying with him a small pen camera. He took covert pictures of everything inside the center and the vault. Before the robbery, Nota Bartolo's frequent trips into the center made the security guards familiar with him, and they got used to his presence. They became much more lax with him, which allowed him to case the center easily. This also allowed Nota Bartolo and his crew to plant a small camera above the vault door so they could watch a security guard open the vault and record the entry code. The camera was difficult to see when the anteroom lights were on, so it went unnoticed. Nota Bartolo's pictures, and the help of a diamond trader insider, allowed him and his crew to build a full-scale replica of the vault. There, they practiced their heist until they had it memorized. The day before the heist, Nota Bartolo visited the vault under the guise of a routine visit. While there, he deftly sprayed women's hairspray on the thermal motion sensors. The hairspray was transparent and temporary, but would insulate the sensors from temperature changes in the room until they were able to disable the sensors. The security cameras saw him do this, but no one took notice because they were used to his presence. The day of the robbery, everyone would be enthralled by the Proximus games. The thieves set to work wearing gloves so as not to leave fingerprints. The King of Keys picked the lock of the building that adjoined the Diamond Center. This building shared a private garden with the center. This garden didn't have any security cameras. The genius was up next. He used a polyester shield to trick the thermal sensors which allowed him to get access to the balcony of the Diamond Center that overlooked the garden. He disabled the alarms there. The police never figured this part out. The crew set to work inside the Diamond Center when Lerdo Bartolo sat outside in the getaway car, listening to a police scanner. All was quiet. Inside the center, the crew covered the security cameras with plastic bags so they could turn on the lights to work in the antechamber. 
The genius took out aluminum plates and attached them to the magnetic door to keep the magnetic field in place while they opened the door. The police were shocked by this ingenuity. Prior to the heist, the King of Keys made an exact replica of the foot-long vault door key. However, the crew had seen on their recorded video that the guards often left the real key in a storeroom, so they opted to check there. They found the real key and didn't have to use their replica. They kept the replica hidden so that the vault's manufacturer didn't know that it could be duplicated. The crew turned off the light in the antechamber before opening the vault door to avoid tripping the light sensor inside. From here, they worked in the dark, only turning on their flashlights for brief periods as needed. The King of Keys picked the lock in the grate inside the vault door. The monster crossed the vault in the darkness just as he'd practiced in the replica vault. He applied a shunt to the wiring in the security system. Initially, the police thought he'd lost the nerve to cut the wires, but Nerda Bartolo said that the monster knew what he was doing. The system sent regular pulses of electricity to check the connection. If they'd cut the wires, the alarm would have sounded. The crew put styrofoam boxes on the heat sensors as an added measure to ensure the sensors wouldn't see them. They also covered the light sensors with tape as an added measure. The King of Keys set to work on the security boxes. They couldn't drill because of the seismic sensors, so he used a hand crank to break the locks on each of 123 out of the 160 security boxes in the vault. The crew emptied these boxes into duffel bags, stealing diamonds, gold, and cash. At about 5.30 a.m., the crew was finished and began carrying the bags out to the getaway car. It took an hour to do so, and then the crew were on their way out of town. Next, it was up to Speedy and Norda Botolo to dispose of the evidence of their plans. They went to the woods to burn everything, but Speedy had a panic attack, and instead of burning anything, he threw his portion of the evidence into the bushes. Meanwhile, Nota Bartolo was burning his portion of the plans. By the time Nota Bartolo discovered what Speedy had done, it was too late. He had to leave the evidence there in the bushes. The hunter that owned the land where they left the evidence stumbled upon it. He'd been complaining frequently to the police of people littering on his land, so at first they didn't jump on the call. But when the hunter mentioned the garbage contained envelopes from the Antwerp Diamond Center, they came out to investigate. Among the evidence, police found a receipt for a sandwich. This led them to Nota Bartolo. They executed a search warrant on him and found a receipt for a sandwich, which led them to the sandwich shop. Using security cameras, they were able to identify Ferdinando Finotto, or the monster, an expert lockpick, electrician, mechanic, driver, and with great physical strength. He was said to be monstrously good at everything he did. Among the garbage was a business card for Elio Dororio. The police believed he was the genius and alarm system specialist. The police believed Speedy was most likely Pietro Tavano, an anxious and tall man. His job was to dispose of the plans. After the heist, Nora Bartolo tried to make himself seem less of a suspect. He returned to the Diamond Center, where he was quickly recognized and arrested. He had brought his wife and some friends with him, and they were arrested as well at that time. A SIM card found at the time of his arrest linked Nora Bartolo to the other three crew members. The police had found the leader of the Antwerp Diamond Heist and three of his crew, but the King of Keys still eludes them. None of the crew ever identified him. He's said to be older and quiet and one of the best key forgers in the world. The rest of the crew served time for their parts in the heist. Nora Bartolo was found guilty of orchestrating the theft and received a sentence of 10 years in prison. He was paroled in 2009 and arrested again in 2013 for not meeting the conditions of his parole. Elio Dororio and Ferdinand Fernando each served five years in prison. In 2009, Nora Bartolo told Wired magazine that the heist was an insurance fraud scam. He said he was hired by the diamond merchant that built the fake vault for 100,000 euros to steal the diamonds. He claimed that when they opened the duffel bags, many of them were mysteriously empty. He said they only stole about 20 million dollars, or about 18 million euros worth. The vault itself, however, was uninsured. There wasn't much insurance money involved. He also said, 
they were going to return the diamonds to the dealer, but the dealer never showed up to receive them. The items stolen in the heist have never been found. Who was the King of Keys? What happened to everything the crew stole from the Antwerp Diamond Center in 2003? What do you think? If you're listening on Spotify, scroll down and let me know what you think. Thanks for listening to today's episode of That's Ready Mysterious. I'm your host, Kelly with an I. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a review and follow That's Ready Mysterious to be updated about new episodes. Tune in next Tuesday for another thought-provoking tale.